You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Boss Hogger Liberty Podcast on the We Are Libertarians Network. I am your host, Jeremiah Morrill. As always, I'm joined by our co-host, Dakota Davis. Our show is about our lives in rural Indiana. This is a show about folks who are involved in politics, and we promise that our episodes are going to be a fun and easy listen. We interview people who are influencers, elected officials, political experts, and people that we just find interesting. Looking around the room, that felt rushed, but it's because it's the second time we've gone through it. <laughs> we had the, the massive audio failure on the uh, on the online feed. Uh, Dakota Davis is here. Cade Coger is here for his second appearance on the show. Welcome, Cade. Good evening. And on the other side of the room, we have State Senator Mike Kreider. Thank you, Mike, for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. So you, uh, let me get this right, you represent District 28 in eastern Indiana. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Hancock County, portion of Shelby County, and Marion County. Right. So, and you've uh, you've been here since 2012. Yeah, I was so, elected in the 12 cycle, and, and this is my sixth session already, and so uh, it's been a fast-paced um, experience. It's been great. So if it weren't for redistricting, you'd be my state senator. You replaced our state senator, and the year you took over was the first one with the new districts, I right. guess. Right. Uh, so, yeah, man, very, very exciting. And you are from Henry County originally, right? It's from in, Hancock or County. Or Hancock County. Yeah. Shirley, I guess Shirley. Grew Shirley, Shirley covered both. I, and I lived on the Hancock County side, Main okay. Street divide. Yeah, that's right. So it was, it was great growing up because my buddies that lived on the on the other side of the street, we had a natural rivalry <laughs> between uh, Eastern Hancock and Knightstown. And, and Knightstown, and yeah. And so the the pickup football games got kind of fun sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, if anyone is not familiar with Shirley, Indiana, they have an octagon house. Right. And they have Ben's Bar. Right. And Ben's Bar has the best biscuits and gravy in the state that I have tried. Right. When I was uh, when I was a 4-H'er, I, uh, I organized the celebrity goat milking contest for Henry County as a yeah. kid, and Senator Gard <laughs> came to that, right. and she was quoted uh, by the paper. They asked her if she'd ever done anything like that before, and of course, nobody had ever done a celebrity goat milking contest right. before, but she said she did kiss a pig, kiss a pig in Shirley once, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the hazards of being a state senator. Right. Man, celebrity goat milking. Yeah. I hope that we, I hope we never get to that level, yeah. that level of celebrity dumb, because I don't want to... Milk a, a goat doesn't sound fun. Well, honestly, what happened is one year we hired uh, we hired we invited uh, a bunch of doctors, local doctors, and uh, Doctor Nancy Griffith was. Uh, with, I think she delivered probably almost every kid born in the eighties and nineties in Henry County. Probably delivered you, Dakota. Uh, I don't know. You I don't to, know who delivered me. I, I have to check. I totally forget what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> but she uh, she grew up on a dairy farm. So she won, and then we let the returning worse and come back, and she won for about the next 10 years until, right. until we ran out of goats. Yeah. So anyway, that was not where this was supposed to go. Right. But uh, <laughs> you said surely, and that's where right. mine went. Yeah. So uh, normally what we do is we try to just kind of banter for the first few minutes of the show, which sure. we successfully did with the, the senator guard kissing a pig. Uh, <laughs> but we uh, we cover the weekend. Dakota, you, uh, you had a big birthday. I did have a birthday. I don't know if it was a big one. Last year was a big one, whenever I turned 21. Yeah, so this is 22. This yeah, is the this first is time you've ever done this episode not being a 21-year-old. That's true. So you're an experienced drinker now. I guess you could say that. And it's you, been a full year. And your bride yeah, turned 21 this week. Yeah, she had the big birthday. Our birthdays are uh, three or two days apart. Two. I'm born on the, I was born on January 1st. Audrey was born on January 3rd, uh, but exactly one year apart. And then my parents' anniversary is December 31st. So you have one busy week, basically. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And, 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 Christmas, and a national cool. holiday. Yeah, it gets it's it gets pretty crazy around here. We always just go to the Elks. <laughs> <laughs> you just spend all of your money at one time. And you were supposed to come with us, Cade, to to my brother's house, Danny, the uh, the Silver Fox of uh, of the Boss Hog Liberty. Yeah. You're supposed to come over to his place New Year's Eve after you went to Pat McAfee, but you never made it. You just hung out, Danny. Yeah, all night. That, yeah, this is how Jeremiah forces friendship. He just makes <laughs> you feel guilty. For not going to the things he invited you to, right, Jer? Is that how it goes? I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> I just create opportunities for people to have social interaction, and if you choose to participate, 
normally you want to come back again because it's so damn fun. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it goes. Cade's, Cade, Cade, keep, keep, yeah, yeah. man, Cade keeps coming back. <laughs> yeah. And that's a lot of fun. Yeah. We went, we went to the show, uh, Pat's show, and then we went to the after party and decided to stay a little longer. So it just went on longer than we planned. Now you were worried yeah. about your second amendment rights going in. How was the, how was the security? I could have made it. You were, you could have been okay. Yeah. I could have been okay. I just, they wanted and, and it went off of my belt buckle and I just showed him my belt buckle and he was like, all right, cool. There you I go. didn't get patted yeah. or anything. <laughs> Hmm. Went to the, the, Murat, <laughs> there you go. the Murat Theater. And whenever we went to see Garth Brooks, and then whenever Audrey and I went to see Jeff Dunham, the security was tight. It was very tight, yeah, yeah. Baker's Life. Yeah, yeah. they they didn't, uh, mine kept going off. I had steel-toed boots on, though. So mine kept, my, uh, the metal detector kept going off that I was walking through, and then I was like, hey, I have steel-toed boots, like, you know. So then they, they felt all around my belt, put, did, like, the finger thing, and... Checked inside my boots and made sure nothing was in there. It's like, hey, yeah. The uh, the other other social interaction, Dakota and I got to have my dishwasher. This is not a future wife joke. My dishwasher quit <laughs> <laughs> working on Monday, and uh, Sarah picked out a new one for me at Lowe's. And then I I called on Dakota. I got I sold my truck last year, and I wasn't sure I could fit uh, fit the new box in the, in there. So I called on That's Dakota. True. And he helped me out because and, I uh, bought the new truck whenever I bought my new truck whenever you sold your truck. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's just how it works. Teamwork. One of us needed to have a truck. Yeah, and it was your turn. Yeah. So you drove up to Muncie and picked up a picked it up for me and watched it, helped me carry it in the house. And you know, you didn't stay to watch me. And then I install left. it for two hours, but no. it was you did enough. I had a puppy to attend to. I yeah, me too. <laughs> you ever tried to install a dishwasher with a puppy right next to you? <laughs> no, actually, I've been smart enough to put it in the basement. <laughs> I had to. Yeah. After after right. I, after he ate three or four screws, I had right. to put him away. Yeah. <laughs> So Dakota and I made the mistake of it. We, we made the wonderful life decision of adopting puppies. We got brother dogs down right. uh, a couple of weeks ago and now we're raising them. He's got a wife in the house and I'm a single puppy dad five days a week. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. Any, uh, any new year resolutions? You, you, did you make one? Is that why you put this in the show notes? Uh, my, not, no, not really. I didn't really even make one. I mean, my new year's resolution since I was probably turning 20 was to lose weight. Now I just... I, I lose weight for like the first four months of the year, and then I just quit. I'm like, nah, this is stupid. And then, <laughs> and then the January first, the next year, I'm like, you know what? I really got to lose that weight again. So it's like every year, 15 pounds goes down in the first like four months, and then I'm done. Yeah. And then it just accumulates. At least you're but, consistent. Yeah, I mean, consistency is the main <laughs> thing, right? I yeah, I started I started back in September, and I'm down 40. Yep. And still, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm not making any resolution. I'm just going to keep trying to keep shaving it off. And Kate, I, I, you did the Brett Bittner podcast, which has never seen the light of day. Yeah. He moved on us and I texted him today. He's in the snowpocalypse in Boston. <laughs> yeah. And I said, can you please get his podcast up? You're sitting at home doing nothing. And he promised he was going to try to hotspot today and get it, get it up there. So yeah. at some point we're going to get your, uh, your story on, uh, on your journey. Cause yeah, it's been a, it'll a happen eventually. Deal. You're down, you're down. <laughs> I'm yeah I'm right at a hundred pounds now since March. Yeah, wow, so, it's crazy. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm just gonna continue with that and see where 2018 takes me. That's right. Maybe I can lose a hundred pounds and get down to where I was <laughs> whenever I was 11. Yeah, <laughs> we're coming after you. What's gonna happen is we're just gonna start borrowing your shirts, Dakota. <laughs> we're gonna come over on Thursday nights and go through your closet and take your clothes. Sounds good. So, so Mike, you've uh, any New Year's res- New Year's resolutions oh, for well, you? Well, um, actually, mine's kind of connected. Um, I, I used to run a lot. As an officer, I tried to stay in good shape. And um, for about eight years, I supervised our officer training uh, academy. And um, it's tradition in our school that you do a 10-mile run at the end of that um, training academy. And so I would keep myself in at least enough shape that I could do the 10-mile run with the new officers just to kind of show them that the old guys could still, still get out happen, <laughs> right, and get out and, and get after it. But um I developed some lower disc problems uh, a few years ago, and and uh, they've kind of settled down now. So I'm going to get out and and try to start hoofing it again a little bit. And that and the benefit of that is, of course, you you end up expending some calories, and and that gives you some yeah. associated weight loss. So and one of our avid listeners, who also happens to be my next door neighbor, which is uh, Zach Zachary Bertram. Uh, he is a huge runner, like marathon runner, and right. he said that in 2017 he logged just under 1,400 miles. It's right. just crazy. Yeah. I, you could just run to Texas. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, just go f- full-fledged Forrest Gump. One of the officers I work with, I just uh, saw that he's going to do ultra marathons, which are up to 100 miles. Oh, my gosh. Um, 
And he did, I think, uh, six or seven full marathons this last year and several halves. And and so um, we were one of the agencies that um, encouraged fitness. And, and um, you know, I, I think you, you see a lot of ancillary benefits from that when officers are in good shape. Absolutely. Yeah. So let, yeah, let's let's talk about your your background a little bit. Okay. I, I guess the uh, you you worked for the Indiana DNR, right? And so that was and that is that is law enforcement, right? The, so, the, uh, I guess people don't always know mm-hmm. that. Or your role, you were a conservation officer, right. which is a law enforcement position. Yeah, DNR is really a collection of about twenty nine different um, areas of responsibility and protection uh, and preservation of natural resources, and so. You know, some of the more visible things are state parks and reservoirs. and um, But the the enforcement branch for all of those activities are the Indiana Conservation Officers. And so um, as a kid growing up, my only goal for a work uh, career was to be a conservation officer. We had a hunting cabin in Brown County, and um, one of the guy's uh, brothers of the of the property where we hunted was a district supervisor, and so uh, I would talk to him about it. And so from the time I was about ten years old on, you know, I was going to wear a green uniform at some point. That was the goal. That was goal. And so I was really fortunate. I made it uh, my first try, and at age twenty one, um, I was hired and um, spent you know thirty years in that career field. Uh, had a wonderful career. I um, was one of those guys that would just do anything that, as the agency needed um, a diver or something. I would say, well, that's something I can do. I'll, I'll be a diver, which was really a terrible job because <laughs> you're essentially going into water you can't see. And as they say, like, we, we don't have crystal clear right, water yeah. in central Indiana. And you're getting drowning victims is, yeah. is most of what we would do. And, and so occasionally you get a good, uh, like you're going to go to Lake Michigan and dive charting uh historic shipwrecks or something yeah. that that was great duty if you could yeah, get that, that. Would be cool but um and so i you know i i had um about 18 years of my career i was assigned to hancock county and it, if you're a uh, a person that likes that it kind of work in the outdoors you don't really want to get promoted and go into the office and so um what happened with me is as uh, about the time my son started getting into middle school and really busy with sports and things like that my wife said uh, you know you might think about one of those office jobs kind of things and so i <laughs> i applied you're a little for, closer to home right i applied for promotion into our headquarters and i was lucky that i lived in in greenfield hancock county because going downtown was like a 30 mile drive and and it wasn't like uh moving like you would have to do if you were going to become a supervisor in another district or something. Right. And so um, I did that. I was promoted in 98. Uh, I spent about eight years at the captain level, which I uh, supervised our um, education programs and our officer training um, programs. And then uh, when Governor Daniels came in, I moved to the number That's two nice. slot That's in the nice. state. <laughs> Sorry about that. I I I went to look at my uh, what's going on here, and I, I I magically got the sound working again. Right. And so um, I uh, in when Governor Daniels came in, I moved to the number two slot in our um, state's lieutenant colonel rank. Yeah, the and, entire state, not just yeah, your not right. just your region. Right. And so I spent two years there, and then I was Governor Daniels' appointee. I for the last four years, I supervised the entire um, operation, which um, really. They put me in this spot where it's kind of the headache seat, you know, where you're fixing personnel problems and you're fighting about budgets. And, and you remember that time period where we were going through. It was a, uh, a, a lot of correction for the state right. of Indiana at the time. A lot of. A lot in of, the Daniels administration. Um, uh, budget cuts. And we essentially would have to, to have conversations like, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to do our officer in-service training the same way. How are we going to accommodate that? And we created this interesting process where we um, created these 15 minute podcasts that we would send out to the officers to their mobile data terminals and we'd have a little quiz or something we would uh, deliver training and things that way but it was kind of a growing period Um, but it also put me in that in that mindset that okay I'd reached 30 years and um, accomplished really everything that I wanted to accomplish in the law enforcement field and so when Senator Guard called me and said, hey, uh, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, 
I'm 51. Why would I retire? <laughs> and she said, uh, well, because I want to, and I think you're a, a good uh, choice to, to be my replacement. And so, um, I, th- I thought, well, you know, I've, I've done the law enforcement thing. Let's see what uh, politics are like. At least nobody will be shooting at me. Right. So <laughs> well, you at least not. you hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you did, you really hadn't identified politics. You kind of were sought right. out by, yeah. by, by Bev. Right. I I really thought that if politics uh, ever entered my life, it would be to run for county sheriff um, after my law enforcement uh, DNR career was over. Um, but as I said, I, I was pretty much um, um, over the law enforcement thing at, at that point. It was a great experience base. It was really a, a tremendous career. And um, the, the interesting experiences, we could talk for a couple of, days about you know interesting things that happened during that 30 years yeah but so uh down here on our show notes we have uh, talking about your educational background Mm -hmm. um is it required for conservation officers to go through the law enforcement academy and so um it's interesting the dnr officers uh, when i hired on at college wasn't required but we're one of the few agencies that requires uh, at least 60 credit hours uh, completed so a good number of our officers go through a program at Vincennes University, conservation law enforcement. Um, but you can you can essentially get two years of college credits anywhere. And most uh, one of the things we changed while I was still there was um, we also will accept um, in lieu of that two years of prior military. Okay. Um, and so the um, you'll notice I didn't go to college, so I got out of high school and got a job driving a truck for Irving materials and drove a concrete truck and waited till I turned 21. And, uh, you know, as, as a law enforcement officer, you don't make a huge amount of money. Certainly you didn't in 1980. Yeah. I think my first year, uh, my salary was $8,500. Wow. And, um, so, you know, I continued driving a truck for them for about 13 years, um, on my days off and, and, you know, we, we worked a lot of odd shifts, and, and especially during hunting season, um, you work mostly evening shifts, it seems like. There's a lot of deer poaching that goes on and things, and um, a lot of the complaints come in, um, it seems like, in the middle of the night during that period of time. So essentially, you know, you're you're working most of the time uh, right. during that period. So that, I also have the FBI National Academy. Right. And so, so what, what is that? And so that's a, um, a really – um, prestigious thing to get selected for if you're a law enforcement officer. About 1% of the police officers in the world oh, wow. uh, ever get the opportunity to go. And it's uh, something that you're nominated for by your agency. And then the FBI selects about 250 officers from around the world. And uh, this is it. Is this police and conservation? Like- well, it's, it's anybody that's in a law enforcement field. And okay. so DNR officers have um, full state police powers. And, right. And then they also have the the uh, natural resources powers and they're deputized as federal agents so that they can enforce the migratory bird treaty act and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I was selected for that in 2003, um, tremendous experience. You're with top shelf police officers, um, from around the world, um, Uzbekistan, Turkey, uh, Egypt and all around. And, and it's, it's essentially a leadership training program. Very interesting. Um, so basically, you guys are you're you're fully authorized as Indiana police officers. Right. Plus, then you have a handful of other almost like ticks boxes that are ticked because of right. because of some of the things you're expected right. to uh, yeah. to enforce. Yeah, that migratory bird treaty. I have to adhere to a lot of that in my career. Yeah, like you probably with, do with right. uh, kill deer and things and geese. Right. right. You know, if they get into substation equipment, you just you know, there's a hotline that we have to call. They right. they give us the instructions on how to handle it. Usually it just ends up we had just bury it in the field next to the sub. Yeah, typically. it's less the case now. But when I was actually a, a more active field officer, we had more active military installations in the state. So Muscatus, uh, Atterbury, um, Jefferson Proving Ground, yep. a lot of those places would have deer hunts each year. And so yeah. if you went in there and you violated some law on the installation, it actually was a federal violation also. Right. I, and so, I actually hunted at Jefferson Proving Grounds yeah. for a youth hunt. Yeah. yeah. That was, I, I didn't kill anything, but. Yeah. Some beautiful areas. <laughs> it, yeah. it is. It's really yeah. cool. 
So would you get involved with the state parks as well then? Like, you know, like being a fisherman or, you know, right. I try to go, you know, and walleye is always one of the things I'm interested in, walleye mm-hmm. and bass fishing. So I know, like, you've got the stocking programs that the state right. state does. Is that something conservation officers are involved sure. in as well, yeah. or is we, that other? We would participate as we could. I think, um, you know, each one of those divisions has um, their personnel that are kind of specialist uh, in those areas. Um, oftentimes, our, the equipment that we were issued was very useful for those folks, and so uh, most conservation officers have either an ATV and a, or a snowmobile or some type of off-road vehicle that they use and a watercraft of all kinds from airboats to huge lake patrol boats and um, kayaks and things that are useful in, uh, in the streams. smaller streams. And so the the types of equipment that, that officers are issued um, makes it, um, you know, pretty valuable. We... We tried to support the other divisions every way we possibly could. And, you know, a lot of the state parks, uh, if they have a campground, they can almost become small cities on a weekend. And yeah. so you have all the same problems, domestic disputes and neighbors that don't like neighbors in the, the next <laughs> campsite and, you know, kids smoking weed everywhere. And, you know, so there's there's all kinds of things that you kind of tried to keep everything as, as calm as possible and, and make sure that the visitors were having a, a good experience as they visited. So, you know, it's it's one of those things. While you you were also the uh, the enforcement branch for DNR, you you tried to be a good uh, coworker also and help any way you could. Yep. Well, the the uh, the outdoorsman stuff is always. It's I guess it, all of us have kind of had an interest in it. Cade right. Cade is an avid hunter as well, and Dakota is. And I he, Dakota took me squirrel hunting for the first time in Liberty. Yeah. He, we went out in the woods and walked around and didn't see a squirrel all day. We no, were on we, one hunter's morning, yeah, but we no. never saw a squirrel. We saw a bow hunter that didn't yeah. have his orange on, and <laughs> we freaked him out because yeah. it was public property, and he thought that we were the officers yeah, sticking up right, on him. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, he didn't take you to Baker Park or someplace like that, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> no. you found a lot of squirrels. Yeah, yeah. No, we could have The next time we go, we're going in Cade's yard. Yeah, right. yeah. Is there, I'm being overrun. Probably as <laughs> yeah. we speak. So. Yeah. The next week we, uh, yeah, the next week we went and shot some guns at Cade's house, and we saw, I mean, we saw thirty or forty squirrels in right. your yard. And we're, yeah. we were at, uh, I guess it's just outside of Mountains SRA or North yeah. of Mountains. I came SRA. home and they were taunting me in the backyard afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Right. I got into bird hunting uh, when I was a young officer and training bird dogs, and so um, at, at early uh, years we had quite a bit of quail around uh, in Hancock and Shelby County, and so. We quail hunted quite a bit. I still take a trip at least annually to Wisconsin to grouse hunt and uh, occasionally pheasant hunting in South Dakota or Iowa or someplace. But, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah I've never I've never bird hunted. Yeah. Have you? No, I never have. Really? I've got some yeah. friends up here that do, and I've got plenty of ground to go do it. I just yeah never been able to. The you dogs still have are to really take the cool beaver part. hunting. Yeah. 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 yeah, we'll have to try that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a uh, one of my good customers does uh, does quite a bit out in. Uh, he's duck does duck hunting, and right. then Matt Wright, who's uh, who's from this area as well. He's uh, he's involved with Ducks Unlimited, who was here right. at Summit, and now he's up in the Tippecanoe County area. Right. And I know Matt does uh, does a lot of that as well. Right. Uh, so let's let's pivot a little bit here. Yeah. Um, the the DNR thing led you into the state senate, and then when we first started having a conversation about having having Mike on the show, you were in the race for Sixth District Congress. We've right. had. Uh, Jonathan Lamb spent on the show. Uh, Stephen McKenzie's uh, political director was on. Uh, Bill Smythe, and then we had uh, Lane Seekman on, and then Nate Lamar right. was on when he was exploring. Sure. Uh, so you looked at and did actively run for the sixth district seat right. up until the last, I guess earlier this month, or I guess the earlier in December. Right. We had the calendar click over on us, and I wasn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm catching yeah. up. So um, I guess can you talk to me about the process a little bit? Sure. And, and you know the work you put in, and then kind of how you made your decision. As you did, right? So I, I um, am probably one of the least political politicians that you've had on the show. I, as I said, I was kind of attracted into the or, or drawn into the the political arena. Um, so you know, I've been um, a senator that's that's taken on tough issues and uh, been successful. And so uh, when Congressman Messer announced that he was going to seek the Senate seat or the nomination, um, several of the county chairmen called me and said, hey, have you ever considered running for Congress? And I was like, no, and I'm not sure I would do that. And they said, well, you know, it's going to be an open seat. Those don't come along very often, and, and we think you should at least explore it. And so 
um, I started talking to consultants and, and, um, and I knew, um, depending on the names that got into the race, I'd either be somebody that was very competitive or somebody that had challenges based on, uh, my name recognition. And, um, so we entered, um, things were going really pretty well. I, w- I would say that, um, I felt like I would be the front runner uh, if Greg Pence hadn't gotten into the race. Um, But when he did, uh, what that did, him having a brother who had been the congressman in that same district uh, raised the expectations financially uh, uh, quite a bit. And so we uh, got together, we did some polling and and got the numbers back. And um, essentially my team felt like we needed to do at least four mailers, um, each one of those mailers cost about $150,000 in a congressional district. And we needed to be on TV in the Cincinnati, Dayton and Indianapolis market. All three, with, three different markets at the same time. Three different markets, all of which are expensive markets. Yep. And then we needed to really hit the, the, you know, the direct targeting social media um, aspect. And so all I of a sudden it turns into a, a, right. a $1.5 million campaign just to win so, a primary. Right. And so I, I said, look, you know, I, uh, first of all, um, uh, being kind of a political neophyte, I don't have the that base of connections that will produce that amount of money. And so it really wasn't a hard decision for me to say, um, look, this this just will not work for me. Right. So um, it was a great experience. I, I would say I traveled. Um, I worked very hard at it, um, traveled the district. Um, and, you know, it, it literally is nonstop on a Saturday morning. You would get up and hit a breakfast somewhere and then a couple parades and try to be at a lunch somewhere. And um, and then a couple of events in the afternoon and dinner and you got home late at night. And so yeah, that's been the recurring thing right. with everybody we've had on is just right. how busy it is. Like yeah. and the size of the district and the yes. district, you know, 18, rural. 18 and a half counties and very rural um it's a beautiful district, you know, for my, I enjoyed it because I would just would drive down the road and enjoy the scenery and, yeah, absolutely. and, um, and the, the people in the district are really class people too, you know, a lot of rural communities and, and people who, who really are concerned about the direction the country is, is, uh, has been taking. And so, you know, we had some great conversations, uh, a couple of the bills I filed this, this session came out of conversations I had, um, in the district that, you know, if I hadn't been running there, I probably wouldn't have had those conversations. So well, it's you've, a good, you've good been experience. able to expand your network significantly with contacts right. in these places right. and more people I'm sure know you and feel like you're approachable now to them. Right. Um, so, uh, once you made that decision, you decided that you were going to, I guess, no matter what, you were going to still be doing this uh, right. session. You were, you weren't going to be dropping out or you were right. still going to serve as the state Senator, uh, right. until the election. Right. Uh, so we're two days into this sh- new session, the short session. Um, I guess, tell us about the process. You basically, you guys have a certain number of bills that each of you draft. Is it, as a Senator, is it 10? Can you 10. get up to 10? Is, yeah, is 10. it a deal? The House has five, yeah. five bill limit and we have 10. Um, and really you, you start that process, um, in early December, really working with legislative services, um, uh, doing bill drafts and, back and forth and what they call PD, a preliminary draft of, of the language that you're looking at. And you shop that around to the, the concerned parties and see if, you know, you're trying to, to affect things in the, in the right way. And, uh, so, you know, I've got 10 bills. Um, I, I typically last session I had 19 bills and, um, I passed 11 of those over to the house. And then the second half I carried 15 house bills. And so, that's again. That's probably one of the reasons why my name popped up as as somebody that might be a, a potential candidate for Congress. Yeah. Whenever you look at um, like whenever we, I've I've been writing these show notes, researching the candidates, um, I always go to Ballotpedia, and it, it, just the amount of committees, the amount of bills. It you have been a busy guy since right. 2012. I yeah, mean, and thank the, God you retired. <laughs> right. The, um, the, the other thing that's happened to me with the uh, retirement of um, Senator Hirschman, uh, it opened up several of the key leadership positions. And so um, I've moved on to uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that, you know, uh, develops the budgets. 
and um, also on rules and legislative procedures, which is the the committee where bills. That's where bills die. They say they go to die, but really, you know, I think most of us try to figure out ways to make them better, or so that they're they're actually um, accomplishing what they hope to accomplish. And so, uh, both of those, it, it's they're really honors to be on those committees. Uh, you're in leadership discussions that. Um, are at, at at a higher level than you probably would be. And so I guess I would say that for somebody that's in their beginning of their sixth session to already have um, the committee assignments that I have, um, I, I'm very pleased with my legislative career so far also. And then you're also serving on a – are you still on the Agriculture Committee? No, I, I dropped Ag not, and Natural okay. Resources in order to go on those other committees. I serve on uh, – I chair – um, Homeland Security Transportation Committee. I'm ranking member on Veterans Affairs in the military, and then I serve on Health Committee. Okay, all right. So the uh, the Transportation Committee obviously was a big one in the last oh, yeah. cycle, right? Uh, and I, because of my day job, I'm I'm in the construction industry, so right. it's something we tracked. And um, we had um, the fellow from Americans for Prosperity was on the show a couple sure. months ago, and right. he, they were one of the leading. At, uh, Critics One of, the of that bill, yeah. right? Voicing their opposition the most, and right? It was Justin, Justin Stevens, Justin I mean, Stevens, absolutely, a, right? Yeah, he was a great guy to interview. He right. had a lot of really fair points, but it was like um, we had known, we had known that they had campaigned hard against it, and then you were also a supporter, and we were like, hey, man, you know, we're gonna have both of these sides on the show. I right. just wanted to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, sure. Right. So, um, I I think the the thing that probably is the most telling about me is. Um, you know, I'm I'm one of those guys that tries to be straight up uh, with the way I do my legislative career. Also, um, I could have taken a pass on that bill, um, knowing I was running for Congress and right. knowing I would have gotten hits, um, and I, and I have gotten hits for carrying that bill. But um, you know, I I went through the um, the summer study committee where we heard from all the experts, and I looked at the uh, the really the challenge. It's not not just the ones that exist today, but in this session, we're going to start talking about autonomous vehicles and, um, you know, and how those vehicles coming onto our uh, right. infrastructure grid That's are going something to something ch- that you haven't had to think about right. before. They're going to change the expectations. So typically if we build a bridge, we're hoping to get a 40 year lifespan out of that bridge. And if you do it right and you do a couple overlays, um, you can get it, to, to about 40 years. But if we're building a bridge now and we need to um, have some type of device built into that structure, we need to be having that conversation now. We don't want to go back and tear up a new bridge in order right. to retrofit it. And so, As a rebar salesman, I'd be fine right. with that. But. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I get that, but we probably would not necessarily go clear down to the rebar. That's we would right. just be just, chipping up that's the right. concrete. You do another, that we've another overlay that has no so, steel in it. Yep. And so, um, you know, by the by the end of the summer study committee, I was not just convinced that the infrastructure bill was the right thing to do. I, I really had come to the conclusion that to not do something was really just a dereliction of duty. Yeah, uh, we had to do. We had to act, and um, and so I think we we came up with a really uh, a proposal. You know, the the ten cents, the the thing that the people talk about the most is really just a catch up to uh, indexing inflation. Right, and I know Representative Soliday worked on this for a very sure, long time, right. and I you know followed his uh, his right. opinions on it as well. And I basically the they said, hey, this was never indexed. So right. you had, you know, you basically didn't have a, ch- have a change since the mid nineties. Is that right? right. On yeah. the, on the, so the purchasing a... power was gone right. for that, for that same dollar. And at the same time, con- construction costs would go up. And, and so we were really in a, in a situation where, um, NDOT was in a, in a, uh, challenge of just kind of triaging the worst example. And, and I think it probably really raised its its face when they started repairing the bridge on 65 and it sunk right um that wasn't necessarily caused by the construction it was just you know it was the it bridge was, was in a challenged compromised position anyway that's exactly right and, yeah that that bridge basically when they tried to do a widening they uh the the pier literally didn't have piles that went down it was more right. of a, a a flat pier without a, a competent yeah. Something drill that they were, something something they were doing in the it. south where they don't have a frost layer. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so Indiana, of course, 
we have weather yep. and, yeah. um, you know, right now it's, it's actually a blessing because it stayed frozen for, yeah, a, we're not for a number of days. Cycle. Right. And so then, then the thaw cycle means that, um, you know, you have water mains break and you've got to break up the roadways and things like that. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you can understand that there, there are people who have different opinions, uh, about the, the bill, but in my district, uh, the surveys that I did, it was very popular. And, and I think the polling we've done since then is it shows that it's, uh, it's got about a 70% approval rate around the state. So with the, uh, it's going to end up being, I think, a billion dollars additional in, in about one point two billion a year. Yeah, is that going to be enough for say seventy and sixty five to be three lanes throughout the state? Or, you know, or, that's or, that's the uh, the other part of this discussion. I don't think it is enough. Yeah, and I think that's why um, you're starting to hear some discussion around tolling, uh, whether whether we will have tolling at some level or not. I'm not sure. Um, I do know that. Uh, the challenge with the with the federal government rules, it's it's really hard. There's only three waivers that exist to toll currently existing pavement, and so in order to qualify for um, tolling allowances, you have to widen and expand the infrastructure system. And so I think um, that's one of the things that you'll see um, as a study takes place that the governor's office has done. Um, a lot of people are concerned about. The, the authority that we gave the governor, but we put a stopgap in that authority that the state budget agency has to approve any plan that um, they come up with. And so, you know, I, already in my list of bills this year, I've got a couple of bills that that try to exempt areas of the state from tolling. So and, the Beltway around Indianapolis 465, right. I think, is on that is right. on that list. Right. And then does it include other like 469 or what it um actually what what happens is and i i haven't seen them yet but the what i think will happen again this year and last year i had those bills uh where where people are trying to um put caps on out-of-pocket expenses for local residents and particularly around louisville and um the northwest part of the state um and so i i think those are discussions that we we need to have as the system kind of expands and becomes a reality uh, it's a little bit premature right now and and i think you know we're trying to be indiana's kind of a conservative state and i think the senate's a, a kind of a conservative body uh, but we're trying to be really thoughtful about the way we move forward with these discussions to try to make sure that uh, the decisions we make actually gets the taxpayer the best result for the for the um the money that we're asking them to take out of their pocket and then uh, I guess the local, the local, like you, you represent Shelby County and Hancock right. County. They've got, I'm, I'm guessing that those counties have six to seven to 800 miles of county road as well. Right. Like Henry County has over 800, 812 miles. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. Somewhere yep. there. Um, so the counties have, with that, the authorization that you had the last cycle, that right. helps helps them with their issues as well. Yeah, right? I would say tremendously. And I I would, I would. Um, that's the, probably the piece that I'm most proud of, uh, my, per- my participation was, um, to try to make sure that the locals had enough money to take care of their system also. And, and some of the things that we've done, and I, I've been really kind of satisfied, uh, with some of the grant money that's been available, um, to see some of the projects actually, uh, come into, to, uh, fruition. And so, um, I went north of McCordsville the other day and I got to flip the switch on a new traffic signal that was, <laughs> was out of the community crossings grant money. And so, uh, those things really have a, a impact on local units and, um, the, the people who, um, use the system, I think are seeing results. Um, I've, I've had a lot of comments from people that say, you know, I, I've smelled more asphalt this summer than I had for years. Oh, yeah. And Road hopefully that's the case. has been right? crazy. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the state, but it, I mean, it's really picked up this year. And if, you're in the, if you're in the construction business and, and the, you know, you hire these, these workers that you hope for going to keep busy for the next several years. Right. Um, having that certainty to know that there's another $1.2 billion to follow this this year up is, is really a valuable thing. A lot of the big road contractors have said, 
you know, for years we we just weren't sure what volume of work we're going to have, and so you kind of kept this workforce that was kind of in flux, and you would try to get them to go to other states where there was maybe some some activity uh, taking place, and so I think it's a it's a good thing for that side of the business also. Yep. Uh, oh yeah. Whenever I worked construction, uh, I was an electrician. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it was always stories about guys that that had the privilege of working on the what was called the road crews, but just installing street lights and pulling right. wire to street lights, and uh, always talking about how good of a job that was because right. it was steady for a while. Right. And they knew that they knew what they were going to be doing, and it was, and it, well, quite frankly, it was it was easy work. I mean, right. it, it's setting street yeah. poles. You know, it's like it's a good job. So I think. I haven't thought about that uh, whenever talking about this, this, uh, the gas tax and the highway uh, bill, but it, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I hadn't thought about the, that aspect of it before. Sure. Yeah, it's very big, very big for the industry to have the predictability because right. it, what happened is we had major moves came along when the toll road right. was leased 11, 12 years ago, right. and that infused a certain amount of cash into the industry. Right. And then when that ended, we had a couple of $100 million additions that were put in mm-hmm. during the Pence administration. Uh, and then those, there wasn't any certainty. So you didn't know right. what was coming. Uh, and honestly, it, you know, we can talk about how things should be funded or what they need to be, but we have a certain expectation in government of, you know, when, when you turn a little faucet on, the water needs to come on. When you, right. when you flush the toilet, it needs to go somewhere and it doesn't need to go into the blue river like mine, mine does right now, but the mayor's working on it. Right. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, and you want the roads to be in, in decent right. shape. Right. Um, and that's one of the reasons I asked about 70, uh, over here, We've got a lot of commuter traffic, so people that right. come from Henry County and, and they go into Indianapolis, mm-hmm. uh, and I know in the last 20 years as I've grown up, Cade, you probably can speak to it too, the truck traffic is just incredible now on mm-hmm. 70 where mm-hmm. you get jammed up and then people right. stack well, up and you have the yeah, but, you have more accidents because you've got traffic that's not free, free but with flowing. once you start heading south, like we had talked about whenever we went to Nashville, and it was three lanes the whole way, it was like... Holy cow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. You only have to do that through Kentucky and, and Tennessee. But I, I will tell you that we, we've already been and explored a number of tolling systems, and they're not the where you stop at a booth and pay anymore. They're, right. they're, they're gantry open, across open the interstate. tolling like you have at, uh, over the new right. Louisville bridges. And so um, one of the things that's really appealing to that is you can lane control based on uh, peak travel times. And, for instance, for one of those semis, if you don't want them to get – in the high speed lane, you can make it too expensive to be in the high speed lane, uh, so that they stay over to the side and let traffic right. function. So there are a lot of um, appealing pieces to this, and I know it's a it's a bit controversial. And people say, "Oh, why, how can you even be having this conversation?" But I think um, you know our infrastructure system is such an economic driver, um, yeah. and um, you know I mentioned earlier a little bit about this. Um, idea of autonomous vehicles and you know you're going to start to see uh, platoons of semis where there's one driver in the front semi and other semis that are keying off of that that vehicle and and so a lot of the the patterns are going to change over the next several years the the question is and just like in your personal finances if you have an opportunity do you have the capital to take advantage of those opportunities if you don't you're in a compromised situation. And I think Indiana has put itself, uh, at least in the geographic region that we're in, in a very competitive situation in this discussion. Is the, during the Daniels administration, the Commerce Connector, like an over, another right. outer beltway was right. on was on his wish list. Yeah. Is that dead or is there, no, is there I, still hope for that in the future? I think there, there's a, a good bit of discussion about that. And I guess the question is, is, is where? Right. I mean, and, that would go right through the heart of your district right. if it came along. Right. And, um, and so, you know, there's there's obvious uh, the congestion. If you want to see true congestion, in Indiana, it's it's go to northwest or go around Indianapolis, particularly the north uh, east side of Indianapolis. Yep. And um, and so the question is where and the and the idea was that you would connect 69 to 70 and then 70 to 74 and 74 over to 65 again and then maybe maybe back up towards back the airport up or towards, towards the west airport. side of Indianapolis. And so. Um, you know, initially, um, uh, Cade's a farmer. Initially, the farmers were, you know, it's prime farmland in, in central Indiana. And if you 
talked to farmers, this road was going to be 50 miles wide and it was going to take out everybody's <laughs> that was, farm. That was the critical mistake that the governor made, I think, yeah. is he released a map yeah. and the, the map looked like it was 15 miles right. wide and yeah. everybody yeah. thought so, it was going to go through their yard. And so, you know, if you're, if you're a farmer and you're moving your equipment, you don't want a road bisecting your farm. I mean, that's not the appealing thing. And, and so there needs to be, um, as that discussion happens in the future, a lot more thought about uh, where it might be. And I know some communities, uh, Rushville, uh, when I was there uh, recently talking about Congress things, they were saying, look, we want it to go down three. That's, we we actually are appealing for some of that to help happen. And that would be for a community like Rushville, that would be such an economic driver. Right. It's one of the biggest regrets. My folks live in Rush County right. and that's one of the biggest regrets that right. the Rush County people have is that I-74 missed them. Right. That, you yeah. know, it, it just does not, it does not cross. They don't right. have an interchange and yeah. that's, uh, it's definitely kept Rushville as a smaller sleepy town right. or community rather than and Shelbyville. S- and so they don't have the Honda plant or they don't yeah. have some other thing that, that might have located there. And so, you know, infrastructure is without question. It's going to be a, a major discussion over the next several years. And and the, the issues that move through my committee um, are really uh, pretty fascinating to, to think. You know, you've got these young engineers that are coming in. You guys are much, much younger than I am, my kid's age. But they're coming in and saying, you know, really, for what we have ability uh, with technology, we're really on the edge, on the cutting edge of what we can do in the future and those next um advancements are going to be kind of quantum leaps to the to the next wave of the future and so um you know there are a number of things that of course autonomous vehicles uh, work off of camera systems and and um you know i already had um manufacturers coming in and saying you're going to need different orange barrels that you put a along the interstate when you're in a cr- construction zone for instance some more visibility so the camera recognize that you're going to need uh, different lane markings where a, a in-dot truck just driving down and painting stripes now you're it's going to some sort of a sensor right yeah it's going to it's going to be a different system and how do how do you accommodate all that and right. so all that raises uh, prices i guess yeah and, it has to get done and you have to pay the people to right. that get it done right and that nobody expects that to be done for free sure and i think that um I mean, not to dwell on this topic, but I think Justin's main point um, being against it was just the amount that actually went towards the road and uh, the amount that currently goes towards roads he felt wasn't enough. Well, I I pushed on NDOT pretty hard, and and their uh, internal data shows about 80% of their budget is going into road projects. And so... um, I think I that's that's an area where I probably disagree with him a bit. I, that eighty percent number, if it's accurate, right. is is pretty good percentage. Yeah, actually it is getting absolutely into construction projects. And so, um, again, for for those folks, it, it's really difficult to design, engineer, implement a road project within a two year budget cycle. And you know, oftentimes they were they would get in the middle of something, so it would create really an inefficient process where they weren't using their money in the most efficient ways. Right. Uh, in some cases, now they've got this ability to say, okay, we're doing this road this year or this section of uh, roadway this year. Next year, we've got this area ready to go. And it, it should be a much, much better system. Oh, cool. So tell us a little bit about your the bills that you're carrying. We, we talked sure. before before the show. I know you, there's one that's uh, in the press today, right. uh, and I guess you have a handful more, and some may be more administrative than others, but uh, you have a bill that's dealing with, uh, with farm ground. Right, yeah, and so um, what I'm trying to do is figure out a way to incentivize farmers to, uh, particularly with, with corn as the crop, usually soybeans don't exceed three feet in height. And my bill, Cades do, but he's yeah. he's got special talents. Yeah. <laughs> but, but my bill tries to encourage farmers with a with a tax incentive to uh, trim the corn back on those sight windows as you're approaching an intersection. I kind of got that idea uh, because railroads use that ca- same concept at their rail crossings, where they require the landowner to trim the trees back so that there's a field division for the train operator and the car as they're approaching the the rail crossing. And so um, we had a really horrible accident uh, this last year, and the farmer feels terrible. The the family of the uh, young man that was killed feels terrible. Um, 
And so hopefully this bill will have, uh, you know, some legs and, and we'll get it through. But I will tell you that, that part of that back discussion is, will that bill be valuable as we move into these autonomous vehicles where cameras are identifying hazards and, and helping the car know whether to yield or stop or, or whatever. And so will this bill be something that's also useful for that purpose? I think it is. So has it been assigned to a committee? Um, it, um, is this in my be, mind, this could go, this could go to agriculture. It could go no. to your roads committee or it could go somewhere else. So I think what it'll probably go to is tax and fiscal because it has a, um, a taxing nexus. Okay. Um, I would prefer it go to my committee cause I guarantee it'll get heard. <laughs> right. Um, but, um, I haven't seen what committee it got assigned to yet. And so my job will be to meet with the chairman of the committee and say, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Can you help us get there? Um, I don't know how many people will take advantage of this uh, process. I think it's it's something that also involves education, and hopefully Farm Bureau and, and other farming advocate groups will will kind of get on board. I mean, uh, the family in, in Hancock County, one of our big farming uh, families, um, great people. The, the, the guy just doesn't see. You yeah. know, it's his own corn. He pulls out, and you know these kids hit him, and, mm-hmm. and uh, it was it was at a four way stop, or no, it was two, it, it was, is, it was they had the right of way, and yeah. you know, and he stuck the nose of his of his uh, piece of equipment out. It was there. a sprayer, wasn't it? A sprayer, yeah. yeah. And those are hard to see out of yeah. anyway with booms, right? When they're folded up, you know, there's yep. a lot but of I blind think, spots. I think he's convinced, and and his brother in particular uh, is convinced that if the corn had been trimmed back. Yeah. that that accident would not have happened. Yeah. And yeah. um and so you can't say that's the case on every situation, but I think you know as policymakers we try to figure out ways to fix a, a problem without creating another problem. So right. so your goal in this is to give an incentive to farmers sure. saying, "Hey, we're not going to tax what is it a certain amount of acreage or a certain Well, it it it'd be a site window that's determined and so um I think you know we'll we'll try to use some national standard as to whether it's like an eighth of an acre or sixteenth of an acre within that site window at, at the intersection, and we'll try to encourage that that farmer to um, maintain that free of shrubbery or any anything that would cause a site impediment at that intersection. And so long as they do that, they would qualify for that. Yeah, exemption. when I when I read um, the article on the bill, that it was like I it was in like an immediate. I could immediately think of a handful of intersections sure. just in just in our area where we live, where it's just uh, horribly dangerous. And I've always thought that um, growing yeah. up in um, South Henry County, that's I mean, it's a farming community. Right. So, I mean, if you drive anywhere, you get you really used to going on the county roads mm. so much so that you just hate going on the highways. I mean, right. yeah. and it. It was always like that. I mean, I, I can remember whenever I was going through high school that even then thinking how dangerous that was. Mm-hmm. So, Cade, um, what what standard practice now for that type of a situation? Is it something that you do, some farmers do anyway? Is it something you would oh, take yeah. advantage of or think about? Yeah, definitely. It's, and really, it's not done, it's not done on purpose. Uh, we're not excessively planting in the ditches on purpose. I mean, most of the times you've got, you know, a f- 20 30 40 60 foot tool and you're going seven miles an hour and it's just depth perception at that point so you come around to a corner where or there's a road intersection and we'll do our best to stay away uh, far enough away to leave areas where you can see around that corner you know especially with corn sure and uh, we'll leave areas and then sometimes it comes up and, and we got too close and we'll go out there and we'll we'll cut the tops off so that people can see over them as they're coming around a corner and we do as much as we can. You know, we, we do think about that. We do think about the safety right. of others, especially traveling traveling along the roads. You know, next to our fields. And and you're just about as likely as anybody to be that car coming through. Yeah, right. exactly. It's, it's your yeah. 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 But, Most... and, and another thing too that I, why I like that idea is on the on those corners. If we were to leave those corners and square them off, that would also give us a place when we're traveling from field to field to put, you know, heads on machines, right. store to equipment, pull into the yeah. field. That way, when we're harvesting, so we pull a combine into the field, we'll have somewhere actually in the field to pull a combine, then pull a truck with the right. head equipment 
that way we're not in the roadway blocking people or stopping people yeah. from getting on, you know, to where they're going. Yeah. And I, I think oh, that's that a good idea. Yeah. yeah. One of the interesting statistics I heard is most people that are involved in an accident, it happens very close to their home. Statistically, yeah, right. that's where you spend within, the most of your time. Within a so mile or so, mile far, or yeah. so uh, from your house, yeah. you're the most likely to have an accident. And so, you know, um, this is one of those things that, you know, I, I'm I'm hopeful. I, I really like the idea of the bill, and I think that um, it can go one or two ways. It'll either get, you know, some opposition and people will try to um, create confusion. As a legislator, you don't want confusion. You want things right. to be pretty clear, and you want to be able to explain things. Um, but, you know, obviously uh, different lobbying groups have different opinions about things, and so they'll come in either try to help you or to try to try to hurt you. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that this is one that people kind of see that it's just a common sense, a logical um, a solution to a, a problem that really is statewide. So I, I would imagine one of your challenges potentially could be county county government. Right. Missing out on revenue or right. trying to administer it, right? Right. right. I mean, they're yeah, have... I think the the administration part of it is probably the biggest challenge. Is is, um, you know, oftentimes you've got uh, big farmers, you've got absentee landowners, you've got people who cash rent, you've got other landowners who have one, one person's getting the economic benefit of the land, and the other person owns the land. And so, how do you how do you administer that in a way that's effective? And I think. You know, generally will depend on the farmers to be the conduit that that makes the situation happen, and uh, and um, hopefully that that works well. The interesting mm-hmm. part of the approach that you have, though, like, that is you're trying to incentivize. You're not penalizing. You're not saying right. if you yeah. go in this area, we're going to come after you, or we're going to. Yeah, that was, you're you're trying to give them an incentive to yeah. to not do it. And I, you know, it's that old saying: you attract more bees with honey than you do with <laughs> vinegar. And so, um, I. I think that that's the the right approach to at least start the discussion, and um, you know we'll pass a bill hopefully, and and we'll see whether we have success with it. I think that we'll have success with it. It makes sense to me right. that people would take yeah. advantage of it. So what what other bills are you carrying so far? So, I know you'll end up with more as as yeah. we go along. But. So I've got uh, a full boat of ten bills. Um, <laughs> I work a lot. Uh, at, several sessions ago, I had a young lady approach me that was raped and. And uh, the the guy later confessed, and so she had a um, a deal where they couldn't prosecute this guy because the statute of limitations had expired. So I began working on a lot of these problems with um, sexual assault and domestic battery and and all those kind of things. And so I'll have a a bill that um, tries to re- uh, get some funding for the state police and local units that investigate. Uh, child pornography crimes, uh, guys like Jared Fogle who had terabytes of, of this horrible um, child pornography. Um, these units, you guys are, are engaged in a little bit of technology, but these these units are seizing terabytes of data and, and uh, they don't have enough resources essentially to get the job done. And so I'm trying to get uh, the state police uh, – a couple million dollars and they could keep a million dollars that for that purpose and then use a million to, to distribute out to local sheriff's departments and city police departments that, that work in this same area. Um, at the same time, I'll have a bill um, looking at statute of limitations on child sex crimes. And really we're trying to address um, these, these situations where the kid uh, maybe um, it's, it's a incest situation or a, a, um, a relative and they don't say anything at the time and later, you know, they um, realize that what happened to him was completely out of line. And, and um, so in most situations, statute of limitations is it's, two to five it's years. It's, it's pretty small. And so we're, we're looking at that. That's something the prosecutors brought to me. And um, one of the prosecutors told me about a, um, a mother who had a, a daughter who said her stepdad was molesting her as a child and she didn't believe the, the girl and, and later divorced this guy. And as she's cleaning out his stuff, she finds a videotape that he made of actually doing it and the statute of limitations had expired. And so these are kind of tough conversations. They're not, um, they're not fun to, to engage in, but they're really necessary um, because I've come to the conclusion that a lot of the, 
the young people that end up abusing um, drugs and alcohol um, are victims at some level. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, it's a recurring story. Yeah. 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 And um, and so I've got, I'm also working on um, the unprocessed sexual assault kits. Uh, last bill last year, I had a bill that um, asked the state police to do a study. We saw the story. I guess probably the results of right. that that there was a just an obscene number right. that were not processed. Right. And so in the thousands, we didn't know uh, how many might exist. I I actually was kind of pleasantly surprised it was 5,200 and not 15,000 like I had heard might exist. Right. Um, and then of those 5,200, about 2,600 of them, there's there's no reason why they weren't processed. And so how can we get uh, – we, we had a bill last year that dealt with um, collection of DNA upon felony arrest. And what we know anecdotally from other states is – as we collect data and enter it into the system, the the more data we enter, of course, the more matches occur. And in these sexual assault kits, the match rate is almost 50%. And so we're trying to figure out a way to, to do two things. Um, how do we address the number that's 2,600 that haven't been processed? And, and how do we continue that conversation with the law enforcement agency that's holding them as to whether they're appropriate for submission. There, there are water called Jane Doe kits where the victim can say at the time of the collection, look, I'm not sure about this, whether I want to participate in prosecution and law enforcement is supposed to hold that kit for up to a year. And um, then they're, they're supposed to be destroyed. I don't know, you know, whether law enforcement officers have said, I think this is going to match at some point, so I'm just going to hold on to it. And yeah. whether that's contributed to that number or not, so we're we're kind of having those follow up conversations, and and this not being a budget session, I'm in a tough spot because I can't ask for money to address that backlog or that unprocessed number. And so we're looking for grant money um, through the Department of Justice to try to address that pool of of kits. But what I don't want to have happen is as we go forward, any more kits to move into that number. Right. So and, you, did, you did touch on a second ago the, the DNA collection. Right. And I know some people in within my circle have had concerns with that. It's, a, the, it's, a, the, it's the collection whenever you're charged. It's not, it's not based on conviction, conviction, right? Right. And then it's the, the, the trust but verify that is right. it actually going to get yeah. thrown out or is your information going to be in the and system? I, and I think um, I think you know, we're, we're going to have to kind of watch that and make sure that, that there are uh, appropriate safeguards because I don't, I don't want somebody that's, that's innocent to be charged. Right. I think what I do know about DNA is it at a high rate also eliminates people from being suspects. And so it's, it's like the modern day fingerprint. Right. And, um, and so that, that kind of has pushed this, this, um, urgency to try to get these, these folks, um, that that are in fact sexually assaulted. They go to a emergency room. They have the kit proce- uh, collected. Can we make sure that we get those processed? And so, my bill this year uh, tries to look at. Okay, going back next year, what number would we ask for for a tracking system? I think we need some type of barcode tracking system. As a police detective pulls that kit at the hospital, and it's used to to collect the DNA or the sample, scan that barcode into the system. We can tell you in the future exactly where that kid is, what step in the process that it's in. And, um, and the victim should have then the ability to, to know what's happening with their yeah, case. And that so sounds like a great idea. And so my, my, I guess my thing in, in a, most of the work that I've tried to do over the years is how do we make the process work more effectively for the person that's impacted by that particular discussion. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, this couple of these bills we talked about are just two of those things. Hopefully yeah. we can, we can make some progress on your process improvements. Right. So going back to an earlier comment, we got a comment from Mike Broyles uh, here in uh, Henry County, and he's wondering about the, uh, the, instead of doing a tax credit uh, for the farm ground 
for the area that's not being used, um, he's wondering about maybe the state just purchasing that ground or, or the county's purchasing that ground. Uh, but I guess this would only apply in the cases when you have corn in place. You wouldn't right. have that credit yeah. in a year where you had grain or uh, right. not grain, beans or, or wheat or a hay field. Right. And I think that's that's the situation that we don't want to get in where the and state then, then becomes an owner of all this ground. Well, and it becomes more ground right. for the state to maintain. Right. And, and so, you have to you hire know, more people on the state's payroll to yeah. clear out the areas and as you get saplings coming up, somebody's got to go out and cut those right. down. And so it's it becomes a maintenance situation. It seems like that um, this proposal really is is a very basic common sense type proposal and I'm I'm hopeful. I I think it likely will see changes as it moves through the process and right. hopefully it'll do that this year. But um you know, I'm I'm filing bills. I filed bills um Last year, I got two bills passed that I filed four times in a row. And, you know, I think that's the other thing I I wanted to say about um, being a legislator. I think people think that you come up with this idea and you file the bill and it just passes through the system and it's done. And that's really not the way it works. It's, it's, a, it's complicated, and I think for a good reason it's complicated, that, that friction, that back and forth discussion that takes place as the bill moves through committees and and through the different chambers is really valuable in making sure that we create the best product we possibly can at the end of the day. And what's signed into law uh, by the governor is something that we don't immediately have to come back and fix. And we've seen some of those things. I was going to say, what, what, that was probably the first thing we want to talk about is the uh, the CBD oil, right? Uh, which I think passed unanimously last year. Right. Um, but we've seen... I guess the attorney general has a different view, yeah. uh, and you coming from the law enforcement background, I'm yeah. sure you have some some insight into it as well. Um, and I, there was like a 60-day a period, so that basically the, the governor gave an enforcement yeah. bridge to you guys. So you've right. got, I guess if your if your group takes action right now, they can they don't have to pull it off the shelves. Is that is yeah, that I something think you're at the speed on yet? Yeah, I I think that's a it you know it's a really complicated thing, and unfortunately the the, the attorney general is right uh, by the law. The, yeah, the strict according interpretation to the interpretation of the law, of the law he yeah. is correct. It's He's just correct. whether the law so, is just or not. So I guess we, you know, I, I voted in favor of the CBD oil. I, I'm, I've got a couple families in my district that have children with intractable epilepsy who, you know, they, they literally go through numerous bicycle helmets a week as the child has seizures, and, mm-hmm. and CBD oil works. Yep. And so uh, the question is, uh, however this discussion moves forward can we create a process that uh, makes sense that's that's i come from the enforcement side i want something that's easy for law enforcement to enforce and for me the key piece is labeling we got all kinds of different systems uh, for different products that are ingested by people that um, that are labeled and Eventually, we're going to be growing hemp in Indiana, and a lot of farmers are going to to be growing it. It's so a very big thing in Kentucky it's already. It's a valuable mm-hmm. commodity. They use uh, the hemp fibers to make dashes for Cadillacs, and there's all kinds of things. You know, it's interesting because as my as this discussion has moved, I'm one of the few legislators that sat on both health committee where we had the discussions around um, hemp, and also agriculture committee where we had discussions around hemp, and so. I mean, I think we've got to we've got to continue to move this. But for me, I think there's a way that 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 Cade's Farm grows this product, processes it, and it's labeled as having come from his farm, and it's certified as having less than point zero three percent THC by volume, and yeah. you know, and that's the way it's it's enforceable. And I guess my concern or. I, I'm always going to come down on the side of more freedom or trying to make sure. things as simple as possible. So right now we've got we've got a small baby step where it's epilepsy only, and mm-hmm. it is um, it's only approved for people that go get licensed through the state. Right. And you have to have yeah. you have to do you have to go through right. a number of hoops to get there. Right? Um, why why control this? Why, why control it at all? Yeah, and I think that's that's the the other piece of the discussion is is. Um, as we move through this, um, Indiana's, I mean, we're still arguing about Sunday sales. 
That's on the uh, list. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're not we're not a, a state that's going to move out in front of the the recreational use of marijuana. And frankly, I am against uh, that. Um, I understand there are some legitimate medical use concerns, and so how do we have this discussion in a way that um, it doesn't open up like Pandora's box and, and create all these situations that we're seeing in some other states. Um, I've been in seminars with uh, legislators who created the laws in Washington, state of Washington and Colorado, and they said, um, you know, uh, without question, we've created a lot of tax revenue but we've created this whole area of ancillary problems that are really difficult. And, you know, just today on the way over here, I was listening to the news and um, the attorney general sessions was saying he's going to roll back some of the, um, I guess, allowances that yeah. Obama had put the in Obama place. Obama had made allowances. And yeah. so, and so is- as long as that, that friction's taking place between the state and the federal level, I think we've got, it's going to be a, a tough decision. Yeah, that that definitely makes it a tougher decision. Right. And it I mean, I can there used to be a, a show on um I I believe it was A&E that was covering the largest medical marijuana dispensary in the world, which was in California, mm-hmm. and the owner and uh he ended up being taken he uh sued the federal government because all of his assets were seized from mm-hmm. the shop after the show started. Mm-hmm. But it was from the DEA even though California had explicit, um, had written into their bill that was legalizing right. medical marijuana that you can't, that a federal and federal and local, um, law enforcement agencies couldn't collaborate, mm-hmm. which is also in a uh, house bill, uh, 1106 that was right. put up by Jim Lucas, yeah. but it didn't matter in that situation. So I, I think yeah. you're right. Whenever you're talking about friction between the federal government and the states, but, um, I think that, uh, you know, typically uh, Republicans are for states' rights. Sure. And I th- right. I think that that is something that uh, Attorney Attorney General Sessions has really dropped the ball on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know what went into his decision, um, you know, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. I, I just think that um, if we're going to have a system in place in Indiana uh, where we have endorsed a particular process, it needs to be as user friendly as it possibly can be. And, um, you know, my son's a state excise officer and, and he's was involved in some of this discussion around, um, whether CBD oil, even without any, um, detectable THC was a look alike drug or some, um, some other uh, definition. And so I would tell you that, uh, having been somebody that made policy and made, uh, administrative rule through the DNR, um, that the lawyers that are involved in that discussion, uh, can, can make it a really complicated discussion. And, um, you know, the state agencies that are left with trying to determine how to navigate that yeah. sometimes have a pretty big challenge. In That's, my experience with lawyers, they tend to make things very complicated. <laughs> well, it's their, their, the way they stay employed. Yeah. That's, uh, that's why I always come down on the side of simplicity and freedom. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> simplicity, simplicity is obviously a, a, a good thing. Yep. Uh, well, very good. So the, uh, they, they did have a big rally this yesterday yeah. too, as well. Yeah. So or do you expect that, that bill to come out of the house or do you, do you have a, do you have a feel for whether or not that's I, going to come through to your side? Um, I, I expect um, it to become um, some type of study. Yeah. And um, I would say that my gut feeling is whether it passes the House or not, it would be dead when it got to the Senate. Yeah. 27 states so far. Yeah. Have it. And I, and I think, gosh, I think mm-hmm. we're about four or five yeah. recreational, but I think and it's I, 27 I tell states you, for medicinal. On, honestly, as I sit here, I'm I, I really have a hard time with a state that's involved in an opiate crisis, um, just kind of opening the door up. And, um, I think that's one of the main reasons that advocates for medical marijuana want it is because the opioid crisis. Yeah. And I, and I, and I believe some of those statistics where it is, it's just uh, so hard to tell. It's not, it's not a black and white issue. 
And that, I think those are the ones that um, are the most uh, complicated to try to get people through. So like I said earlier, you want if your bill, you want it to be simple. Right. And you don't want all these outside influences in. And, and really the cold beer and the cold uh, beer discussion has really been driven by two different parties, both of which are going to benefit in different ways. Neither one of those parties is a consumer. Right. <laughs> and so and so the consumers left because right. of the... We don't have a lobbying group. Right. Because of the conflict, they're, they're left with, okay, I, got, I have to figure this out. And so, right. um, you know, we're... I think we try to do the best we can, but, but, um, we will likely see a pretty substantial movement on, on that issue this session. Um, and you know, the, the other parts of this, I think as other States and as the federal government, uh, makes some, some moves, we'll, we'll see, you know, Indiana kind of trying to be, but we're probably going to be more cautious than most states have been. Do you have a position yet yourself? Are you a cold beer six day a week guy or a warm beer seven day a week guy? <laughs> I honestly don't care. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, most of my constituents um, say that it's a legal, um, highly regulated product and, and they should be able to get it whenever, however and whenever they want to get it. Yeah. And And frankly... You know, when you create all these allowances, if you're a micro brew or a micro winery and you can do this and do that and you can't do it over here. Yeah, then um, what's the point in even? You, you take away any legitimate arguments about um, yeah. any restriction then. Yeah, yeah you're the, the old argument of, of morality is totally gone. Well, I mean, it, so so I deal a lot I, with mental health challenges and, and you know, they're there's a huge difference in uh, bad habits and addiction. And so, you know, can we figure out ways in which we don't contribute to the addicted, the, the really negative use of, of some of these products and leave all the rest of the people out of the discussion to the extent possible. And that's, that's kind of a tightrope to watch. When, uh, when Rex was running for governor uh, last cycle, it was, uh, we talked about there was a difference between bad, uh, Bad habits, crimes, and vices. Right. And uh, I appreciate you, you mentioning that because it's, uh, you know, while it may be a bad habit, it's not necessarily something yeah. that should be criminal or, you know. So I, I uh, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is for, so I was going to retire at age 51, and my wife says, you're not sitting at home at age 51 while I go to work. And so so I took a job. Watch me. I took a job um, running the security department and the disaster management uh, programs at Hancock Regional Hospital. And, um what that did was it put me in the ER where I dealt face to face with addicts and and people who had PTSD from military issues and mental health challenges of all shapes and sizes and and things and and so what I if you look at my work over the last 6 years you'll see a heavy focus on on mental health and how do we how do we figure out ways to get that person and that person's family a better outcome uh, because they become the most difficult people to deal with. They, they don't fit well with society norms. And, and, um, and so that's why I, I came to the conclusion that, you know, probably you guys know um, of people, even with the use of alcohol, where the, you know, that one person who can drink a beer or two or, or something, but if he goes over that, he becomes just an idiot, yep. and and he's a person that has alcoholic tendencies. Oh, and I then mean, Cade drank that yeah. one, and it's making me nervous. Yeah, right here. and so, <laughs> but by the same token, you probably know guys that can do just fine as long as they stay on beer. But if they right. go to hard hard liquor, then they they become yeah. a guy that's fighting and yep. and a problem. Absolutely. And so, you know, all of us have various um, challenges all of us including myself and and um how do we how do we try to figure out ways to, to help the people that need help but really not hurt the people that don't need yep. uh impacted in and so one of the things i'm working on this session that we were talking about bills and hopefully we can continue to you're, talk about bills yep um so i was meeting at uh, Fayette regional hospital and um 
we were talking about the challenge of of people who become addicted from the medical community and you know nurses and respiratory therapists and even um uh, anesthesiologists and people like that have access to drugs and sometimes they become addicted and and so as a state we've tried to um, look at these inpatient intensive treatment programs where there are a lot of wraparound services and and then follow-up counseling for a period of time usually it's six months with a in residence portion and then uh, some some follow-up uh, process and in that discussion we were having there the CEO of the hospital said you know, the most valuable person for me um, to use in my treatment program is somebody who has a shared life experience, somebody that's come out of addiction, is now doing better and moving uh, to a better place in their life. And the challenge they have is it's difficult for them to get their felony record expunged. Absolutely. And um, because of that, they have to wait seven or eight years in order to become relicensed again to be a nurse or whatever they were. And so I wrote a bill this year that says, if you have come out of one of those programs, participated success, successfully, the program signs off on it, the local prosecutor and the local judge signs off on it, then you're eligible for immediate expungement, and then you can become relicensed. And hopefully, um, instead of not being able to find a good job and um, struggling, you'll be back as a productive member of society uh, more quickly, and hopefully that valuable link that helps um, those those people who are going through that treatment program again. Again, that's one of those examples, I think, of trying to be thoughtful as a legislator to say, how do we um, tweak the systems that we have to make them work more effectively? And And if the discussion is that we're not comfortable with the person that comes out of this six-month program, then fix the six month program, right? So that we are comfortable. Exactly. And and so, I mean, I I guess those those are kind of those are just a few examples. I of course I get uh, a lot of the um, agency bills. I've got a bill, a state police bill. It's a cleanup bill. Um, this may or may not be controversial. One of the pieces of it is um, that you'll have to carry that little card that you get from your insurance company that says you do have insurance Oh yeah. because too often the person gets insurance and cancels it and then they hit you and they're uninsured motorists. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that's very common in other states. Too. Right. And so yeah. it's just trying to keep us up to, up to speed with some of the other states and that, you know, that may or may not be something that people don't like, but it, that's just one component of uh, that whole discussion yeah. of the state so police agency. Bill. You're wanting them to have to carry the card on their person instead of showing, and yeah, instead of just having the the number on their registration, which mm-hmm. the you know, B and B will just carry over from year They'll to just year. Take right. any number. Does it doesn't mean that you have insurance? And so, you know, ag- again, the the bad actors are the ones that are hurting. The I'm, I had a son that was hit by an uninsured motorist, and it. It uh, actually just helped our insurance rates go up because uh, yeah. my insurance company paid for it instead of the right. other guy. Of course, you could still have the guy that goes out and buys a, a policy and then cancels in 30 days and still has sure. a piece of paper that looks sure like it's valid for still another had, 11 months. Still has a card, right? Yeah. But he's got to do that. But most people aren't going to do that, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, going back to your just a real world, I had a conversation with a fellow today who went through a um, – he had he had possession of, of of something because he was hooked at one time and he's been sure. good for fifteen years ten right. years, uh, but the felony's still on the record and you have real employment concerns. Sure, um, and it's you know I I definitely think that I'm very much applauding what you're what you're doing there. But it, just anybody that's had you know a simple possession or a nonviolent crime and you've got a right. felony that's on your record, it's there's a there's still a big burden in administrative hassle for somebody to get that off of their record and right. often they're they don't have the job or the resources to go through right and to get that removed you also um, can't but own it gets a firearm stuck. yeah and you can't own a firearm yeah well it's um I'd certainly i wouldn't be willing to do that for violent felons right. yeah um, absolutely but i think mm-hmm. i think there's another segment of society that you know look, look they made some bad choices and and um you know unfortunately you don't know I, I know of one situation where the guy used a particular drug for years and then it quit 
giving him the high, so he started to mix fentanyl with it. Well, mm-hmm. fentanyl was the one that, the drug that got him really addicted. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've got, we've got car fentanyl now, which is like 10,000 times yeah. as strong as regular fentanyl. And, and, you know, officers are getting some powder on their uniform and flicking it off and becoming, uh, overdosed. Yeah. And there so, was an officer in Ohio that overdosed and right. died because he had, uh, accidentally flicked some off of right. his, off of his uniform yeah. and so, just that little bit of skin contact. So it's, it's a, it's kind of a dangerous world. And I, I you know, we had. We had this interesting discussion around needle exchanges during the the last session. Um, I was probably the one that argued the most passionately for letting local units decide for themselves what works. Yeah. Uh, because my my point at the microphone was I interacted with addicts daily at the hospital. When I put my hands on a person to control them, I never worried about catching an addiction. I always worried about catching hepatitis or HIV. Yep. And the needle exchange program is completely designed to stop the spread of disease. Right. And so, you know, you have you have all these other discussions about, you know, are we feeding the addiction? We're we doing all these things. Well, uh, perhaps. You know, yeah, but you also but, look at some of the northern European countries that yeah. you know they they said, hey, we have a heroin problem. Problem. They admitted it, and they. Yeah. Gave heroin to people and they reduced their addiction yeah. by fifty percent. So, uh, and so I think that's the <laughs> because they get into know, a clean environment. That's the thing. How how can we be thoughtful in these discussions instead of just saying, "Look, there, this is a bright line, and I'm not I'm not going near that line." And so, I think that's probably the thing that I've tried to do um, during my six years there is is be a person that that stands up, and when you say something, it's not some. Um, off the wall comment it's you know it's thoughtful and and uh, we're really trying to move uh, policies that make sense and they're really um, if they're applied properly have a, a good benefit for the public that we serve so one more uh, hot topic issue that i think is going to be coming uh, coming through i have this little pink card that i had to pay the state to carry uh, so that i can have right. my lifetime uh, handgun permit right. uh, uh, there's a bill that's trying to eliminate that right uh, is that something that you think has life where we don't have to license our license our rights anymore? Or where that, where's that one going? See, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, um, you know, I, I grew up with a gun in my hand from the time I was, uh, nine years old, I was hunting by myself. And, um, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that a farm's just a tool, just like a hammer is a tool. And, and, um, I don't have to pay the state $135 yeah, I, I to, bar, to, to have and a hammer. So, <laughs> So the, the now, hammer isn't mentioned you know, in the constitution I, either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm a second amendment guy and I, I think that, you know, we can, I certainly, I don't have a problem with what Jim Lucas is trying to do and some other folks, but I would tell you that there's a huge amount of resistance out there yep. uh, mm-hmm. for that particular uh, topic. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to dog him at all, but he, he is um, a guy that does not shy away from a fight. And so, um, he, he helps, um, build the opposition in some cases. I wish he would it's a different approach, just, just kind of like, um, <laughs> uh, the, the president tweeting all the time. I wish, <laughs> I wish, uh, that wouldn't happen. I'm probably not as well versed as I should be on that. Um, but the only issue I could probably see in that would be reciprocity. Right. Could you shed any, any light on what, so, what would happen if that were to pass? And so I, I can give you kind of an example okay. and, and why I'm a, just a little bit concerned about it. Okay. Um, and so Illinois doesn't have a, a hang-up permit. They have a federal firearms license or FFL. Um, and so when when somebody wanted to come to Indiana to hunt, mm-hmm. we required a hang-up permit. Um, because they couldn't have a handgun permit, they couldn't use their handgun here legally. Mm-hmm. Now we, we as officers would say, you're doing the best you can. Yeah. You're doing the best head. you can, yeah. uh, you know, have fun. Right. Yeah. But, but I'm not, I'm just saying that, that all law enforcement agencies aren't, don't have the same philosophy and all states don't have the same philosophy. And so, um, I, I really, uh, was hopeful when I started hearing this discussion being have, had in Congress that we would see some movement um, on the federal uh, level that, you know, so long as you're licensed in one state, you're recognized in any state in the country. Just like a driver's yeah. license. And, yeah. um, but uh, my, my permit's but, not good but, in Ohio. I right. can't carry in Ohio. Right. 
or Illinois. And, you know, and, and there are all these, these kind of, uh, um, I call them lawyer tactics. You can get a, a Utah permit or you can get some other permit that's recognized in other states that Indiana yeah. might not be. And so there are all these methods around the madness kind of thing. Um, I, you know, most people want to be legal. Tell us how to be legal. Yeah. Yep. And um, I think we as government have an obligation to make that clear and easy to understand as much as possible. And I think we failed in this particular discussion. Well, I'm glad we're having it. You know, it's, it's, I think it's an important one to right. have. And I don't know, sure. I don't know where we're going to end up if it's going to be, you know, it, it, I don't know. Are we going to have to pass a class? You know, it, it, it may be yeah. the happy medium is we, you pass a class and you show that you've passed the class and then, and then you don't have to so, be licensed. So I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I uh, was administrator of our education program. Um, in the early uh, 70s, we were seeing about uh, 30 hunting accidents a year, the type of hunting accidents where somebody shoots and covers somebody else and they're sprayed with shot or whatever. Um, and we started in 74, we started the Indiana Hunter Education Program, which is 10-hour, you know, it's, it's just basic yep. farm. I passed it in 1999. But I would tell you that our what we saw over the years was our hunting accident numbers went way down. Mm -hmm. And today, there are just a few annually, and, and most of the problem that we have is people falling out of tree stands, right? They don't yep. wear a harness yep. in their tree stand. And so so I, I'm a believer in education being, and, and frankly, if that were the... Um, if that were the compromise, that were the compromise that took away the opposition, I would say, I think most people would would agree that it's it's okay. Yeah. Um, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with. I would much rather pay to uh, to be educated than right. pay for a card, right? Like an NRA program or yeah. or a hunter education card is showing that you understand the basics of the functioning of the firearm. Uh, you know. But just to give you an example of accidents I've heard of is as people drop the magazine and forget that there's one in the tube yep. and they are messing around with it. And of course it discharges and they're like, how did that happen? I unloaded it kind of thing. And so that's one of those things that if you don't have a mentor, a father figure or somebody else that introduced you to farm, it's hugely beneficial to understand just the basic functioning of that yeah, particular absolutely. farm. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm one of those guys that just says, let's, let's figure this out. Let's take away the arguments to the extent possible. But at the end of the day, I've got to have 26 votes in the Senate. And I've got to have 51 votes in the house. And then I've got to have a governor that agrees that he's going to sign that particular piece of legislation. And so, uh, hopefully we'll keep the discussion moving and it'll be done in a thoughtful way. And, um, you know, I, I'll weigh in to the extent I can, you know, I, I tried to do that. Um, we passed a rifle bill, uh, for deer hunting a couple of sessions ago. It's just absolutely messed up bill. I didn't vote for it because it left out guns like two seventies and lots of really good rounds and, and include a 300 wind mag that you could kill an elephant with. <laughs> yeah. And so is this, I'm saying is this the one that messed up pistol hunting or right, the, the, yeah, yeah, this yeah. last. And so I'm saying you guys really messed it up. I should have stood up at the microphone and killed it. I have the ability to do that probably, um, as the, as the ex DNR guy. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything wrong with using rifles to deer hunt with. And so, um, you know, I'm one of those guys that says, okay, in our state law, we've got a minimum requirement to kill a deer. And right now it's two sticks, a string and a, a sharp rock. Cause you can use a flint napped primitive yep. longbow yep. to kill a deer. And so that's the minimum expectation. How do we set a maximum expectation and, and then try to be reasonable with everything. Say if it's less than here. It's not okay. If it's, over here, it's not okay. Yeah. So everything else kind of falls in the middle. That's the kind of thing. That's the kind of discussions I like to have. And it's a it's always an interesting balancing act between whether or not it needs to be an administrative rule or if it needs to be you guys yeah. deciding calibers on the in the, yeah. in the state house. I I, uh, I I would tell you this that um, most legislators have no business deciding what the hunting rules are. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'm probably the exception. I'm right. not trying to say big headed, but I spent 30 years of my life out regulating hunting activities and that, that, um, you know, when we, when we first started this discussion at DNR with, um, pistol calibers, uh, rifles, I said, look, this is going to become a confusing discussion unless we say you can use this, 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 and this. And, and try to have a logical argument as to why we allow those. They have a lethal ballistic range of 150 yards or something. And we say, oh, that's the standard. Yeah, right. And um, and then everything else that's created and comes along that fits within that will say it's okay. But what we did was we created a situation where guys would go out and wildcat and create a 358 Hoosier, which has the same ballistic range is a 30 out six yeah. and they figured out a way to get around our system using the the law right that yep. we wrote yep. against us and so i mean we just have to be smarter than that and then Absolutely. technology also caught up sure. there's also smokeless sure. muzzleloaders you know that have right. all kinds of range uh, just standard black powder muzzleloaders nowadays right oh yeah you know inside 300 yards you can if you're a good yeah. shot you know you can hit something good shot so. mike brant spicer has pointed out that mike sign is taking a tumble if you're watching the live stream <laughs> it's half it's half down. We have to we have to repair it. Need oh, an emergency no. repair for him. Jer, quick correction. I think Ohio does recognize Indiana's permit. They do license to carry now. I yep. think Ohio Maybe, does. They, Illinois does. They it. are a they are duty to inform. So if you do get pulled over, or have any interaction, you need to let them know as soon as you get pulled over. Okay, that should be common knowledge. If and you're I carrying and it should be anywhere. Yeah. And honestly, I think you know, as a law enforcement officer, all I wanted to know, yeah, was I've got a handgun. It's in my console, and I would say that. Most conservation officers are probably too relaxed around firearms yeah. um, because you just are around them all the time. Even, the expectation even, you have. even guys out fishing are going to have a handgun in their tackle box a lot of times. Yep. And oh, so Northern pike are dangerous, okay? They, they can be. <laughs> <laughs> They've got some teeth on them. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, well, Mike, I appreciate you coming. Uh, this is kind of the part of the show where we get to final thoughts. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, or we didn't we didn't cover today? No, it's been it's been great to share some ideas and thoughts with you guys. Um, I think you know we're I'm an example of just what you see in, in the Indiana legislator. I most of us aren't um, career politicians. Most folks, there are a few folks who are kind of what I call legacy guys who whose dads were involved and and whatever but but i think um the one thing that i try to tell groups is is if if mike Kreider is a state senator anybody can be because i grew up in small town shirley went to school at eastern hancock i didn't go to college um now i've had a lifelong learning um discipline in my life where i always tried to expand my capabilities but you know the reason I ended up in politics was because I was successful at something else and people recognized I had the ability, the people skills, the other things that, that might be transferable skills to this process. And, um, and it's, and it's really fun. It's a satisfying thing to take some of the issues that we've talked about and take them from concept to sign into law, to have somebody call me and say, you know, your Jenny's law that dealt with statute limitations for rape, you know, that there was a guy caught on a stalking charge in Boone County. And when they entered his DNA, it matched a sexual assault that was 25 years old. And this lady now has justice. She has closure in her situation because of something that you had a part in implementing. And I think that that's the really what most of us are there trying to do there there are people from the schools of thought that say there are way too many laws in the books for every law you pass you ought to take a law away but i think what we do most of the time is we tweak the laws that exist and we try to make them work better right give us a better outcome and, and it's you know, it's really a satisfying thing. We always say the legitimate role of government is to protect us from force and fraud. And when you're working on those things, I think you know I think we're going to find a lot of common ground. Sure. Uh, how do people follow you if they want to get in contact? If they want to, you know, I know you're going to have a campaign coming up. I imagine about a year again for no. For your I, seat. I'm actually I was reelected in in 16, so I'm good oh, so till 20. Two, two years, yeah. I, okay. I've got, uh, and so I I spend a lot of time on Facebook. You can you can uh, see I'm not shy about sharing my opinion on on Facebook. Um, 
And, um, you know, they can contact me through um, my office in Indianapolis. Um, the one thing I tell folks is don't, you know, if, if you make a contact with your legislator and you don't feel like you're getting a result, don't be afraid to reach out to me. I'm a guy that's that's not opposed. I, I feel like most of the things I work on have a statewide impact. I don't look work on just very regional things most of the time. And so um, if you have a concern um, that you feel like I can be helpful with, let me know. Very good. Kate, any final thoughts tonight? Um, happy New Year, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back. I, I appreciate you guys inviting me on to be another co-host and looking forward to the rest of this year. Oh, very good. We're, I'm glad you wore the flannel. We all broke out our flannel today. Even Mike's got it on in his <laughs> yeah, undershirt it there. there. We'll take a uh, we'll take a picture to post with the podcast after after the show's over. Dakota, anything for us? Uh, final thoughts. Um, Mark Coger was elected as the uh, city of Newcastle's county council or county council city council, city council. president again, and he is uh, my representative. So, well, hometown pride, home area pride. Um, but uh, Ward Three represent right. Uh, or whatever I'm, you are. I'm Ward 5, actually. <laughs> Ward 5. Um, but, yeah, I like Mark. He's a really good guy. So congratulations to him. He's also a listener. Um, and then uh, some more Newcastle news. They have torn down the bathrooms at Baker Park and uh, are now they are going to build bathrooms on trailers and so that they can take them out of the park every night and clean them out and keep them from being vandalized. We just can't have nice things, can we? We have to. Nope. They've been vandalized so bad, so they're tearing down all the bathrooms and building them on trailers. We'll see how that goes and how the um, how the people who enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act feel about that. Uh, so just a little update for Newcastle, because I've been following that and try to give an update there. Oh, very cool. Uh, Atokad Savad on the Twitter? Yep. All it's right. Dakota Davis spelled backwards. There you go. Uh, I'm looking forward to this weekend. Next uh, next week, we've got a, a the uh, I, I think it's just going to be four of us, or have to be a little bit more of a fun episode. I don't think we have a political guest, so it'll be a little bit more laid back, and we'll talk about the news of the uh, news of the week and uh, going to Chicago with uh, with the Davises, uh, yep. my fiance, Tomorrow the lovely noon. Sarah Potter, and uh, and the Davises. So we'll see. I'm going to go see Second City and check out uh, check out a. Uh, a show up there, which is something I've always wanted to do, so that's going to be fun. Uh, you, you definitely can't carry there. No, no, I'm, I'll that's, leave it. That's at home. unfortunate. No, <laughs> Russ. That's one place I want. Unless to carry. you're a criminal, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you want to carry in Chicago, <laughs> but there's no way you can. No, we'll uh, we'll leave them at home and try to stay on the paved roads. So uh, appreciate everybody following. Uh, the way we grow is uh, your likes and subscriptions. So uh, do what you can there. Uh, you can catch our replays on Indiana Talks on Saturdays on uh, on their web show, uh, of course. Uh, always available on TuneIn Radio and uh, your podcast uh, your podcast feeds plus the YouTube. We'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Get our other shows at wearelibertarians.com. <laughs>